Okay, so um, today is pure review day, so we can do whatever you guys want to do. If you want to um, do some specific problems, if you want to, uh, I would think we might want to do one from chapter 10. So we might as well start there and kind of work our way backwards, right? Uh, just to remind you, this last test will have uh, chapter 7 chapter 8 and chapter 10. Okay. Last time, we actually did all of 10. There's only two sections and uh, there won't be any custody and interrogation today. Um, there are only two sections in 10 and it breaks it out. We, both, we do them both in the calculator once. So I'll give you a problem. It's got both of them on there. 10-2 I think was our value and 10-3 is the line of best fit. So I just do at all and I think actually the homework is the same problems. Yeah. If I remember right, just like two two, just like forever ago when you had to do histograms, same data. Just I would just do both sections at once then. Right. So are there any specific ones you want to look at related to chapter ten, or just want to pick one and go to town on it, or? You guys doing all right? Yeah. yeah. No? I'm sorry. It is that time of year for anything happens in your life, and it's like, yeah. Because it's bad enough already, just being in school at finals time. Trust me, on the teacher side, it's bad too. So it doesn't really help you out, but just to let you know. Yeah. So in uh, 10 to our number 10, I was just wondering, are you assuming it? Oh, let's say number 10. Yeah, if they don't say, we assume it's 0.05, because that's the one that's most often used. It's funny, though, because on the next set of data, on the next set of problems, they do tell you use alpha 0.05. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sometimes, I don't remember if I assigned a problem like this, but in the hypothesis test section, did anybody do a problem where they didn't give you an alpha? Yeah. Wasn't there? Okay, good. And the reason that is, is because if you get a z-score of like 0.1, this is a good question by itself, what can you pretty much say right there? Did you reject the null or did you fail? If you get a z-score of 0.1, did you reject the null or did you fail to reject it? totally failed. Because did you get very far away from the mean? No. no. So there's no way in hell. I don't care what alpha is. Alpha would have to be stupid lenient to say, oh yeah, that's enough evidence. You're one-tenth of a step away from the mean. Whoa, that's crazy. No, that's stupid. Right? So in some problems, if they don't give you the alpha, it doesn't matter. Either, or if you get a z-score of 28. Okay, that's, you know, that's crazy. You rejected the, the hell out of that null. Right? There's no way it could be good. So in here, it might, I don't know if it's the same way, honestly, to tell you honestly, because I don't think I ever really noticed they didn't put that down there, but it might be just such uh, extreme, you know, if you get 0.9999 for R, hey, that's evidence. Or if you get 0.06, ugh, no. Right, I don't know if it's an extreme or not. But if it is somewhere in the middle, just use 0.05. Yeah. Um, any other specific problems we want to look at or? Okay, so let's look at, uh, yeah, these are not very interesting problems, it sucks. Have you guys, did I assign the one about crickets in temperature? No? Yeah. You guys ever hear that? That if you list, if you count the number of chirps, chirps that a cricket makes, you can tell what how hot it is? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what the hell, let's do that one, right? Uh, this is number 26. In either section, doesn't really matter. Uh, page 512 is the one I'm looking at. 512. Page 512, yeah. By the way, I'm working on my final exam week schedule. 
because obviously my office hours are going to change a little bit. Plus, I think I'm going to be in the Mass Study Center for a few hours. I haven't had time this whole semester to be in there, which kind of sucks. I miss it. So I, I'll let you know next week what my finals week schedule will be, when I'll be where. Right? Our final is on Tuesday, if I remember correctly. So that's on your syllabus and your homework sheet. Oh, that's familiar. All right. So look at number uh, 26, crickets and temperature. So let me help the book list amongst us. And let's all just take a second and do the exciting data entry that is a part of statistics. No, I didn't bring any, sorry. So if you don't have a calculator with you, just uh, sit and watch it. Yeah, sorry. But here's the data, at least. Uh, let's see. So the chirps in one minute go into L1. Whoa. That was bad. Yeah, the chirps are your X's. They go on L1. Come back. Hey, whoa, there it is. All right. So number 26. Go ahead and put that data in. Let me do that at the same time. So like was just said, uh, the chirps we're going to treat as our X variable, so they go in L1. Does everybody got the data in their calculator? Can I take this away? So one really nice thing to see for these chapter 10 problems is when both lists are the same size. That's always nice. It really sucks when you get to the end of some 50 long list and then they're not the same size. You have no idea which one you skipped. Uh, so they're the same size. What do you never do with these lists? L3 is just left over from, uh, we don't need L3. Okay. It's just left over from, I don't care about it. Um, never sort them, exactly, because that would force everything to be a linear relationship then. Everything in the world is correlated. Uh, that would be kind of freaky. Um, so if you have your own calculator, you, and you were here the last time, the last class, you don't have to go back and set anything else up. Your R should be showing up. Your stat plot should be turned on. It's just ready to go. Right. Uh, so when I put new data in, if I just want to see the scatter plot, what do I hit? What do I do to, to see that scatter plot? <coughs> Beautiful. Because if I hit graph, well, there's my leftover line from last time, right? I'm not going to see my data. So if I hit zoom 9, it forces the calculator to zoom in on my statistics. So there they are. 
So just looking at that, what would you predict the R value to be? Give me some rough estimate prediction. What the R value is going to be. Slight positive incline means 0.3. Now be careful, the, the, the R value, is the R value the same as the slope? No. no. It's not the same as the slope. Uh, it's positive or negative like the slope is, but the R value tells me how tight the points are to the line. And I think these are pretty decently close, right? Not really tight, but decently tight. So I'd hazard a guess, what do you guys say, I'm sorry? Point 0.3. Point 0.3, I'd say more like 0.7 maybe, right? Point 0.3 would be even more scattered. Just a barely a, a, a positive trend, right? That's a pretty strong positive trend, I think. Can you show me how you got there again? Oh, sure. Um, so we put the data in. And if you just want to see your scatter plot right now, because we haven't put the line of best fit in, you haven't even calculated it, hit zoom 9, because zoom 9 is stat. Hopefully it's 9 for everybody. And then this should show up here. Cool. How are we doing so far? Now, how do I actually go back and calculate the line of best fit in the R? So, we have to show you this on the test? Yes, on the test, you'll actually have to get up, come up to me, show it to me, and then I put a little something in your test to let me know that I saw it. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. You want us <clears throat> to come up and show you, like, this? or the I, want to sh I want you to show me the finished product. Okay. Yeah. So, don't show me this. You're right, because then I'll send you back and say, where's your, where's your line of best fit? I want to see the thing with the actual line on there, too. Right. And we can kind of, it looks like it's probably going to be about like that. Right? You should have about the same distance to the points above it as the points below it. Those should kind of equal out. So, where do I go to calculate this, sir? Stat. Stat? Calc, that seems to make sense. Four. And number four, that's kind of a giveaway there, right? I want a line. Well, there's the one that's got a line in it. And it defaults to, now be careful, this is from yesterday. So don't freak yourself out if you're working your calculator, it's old stuff. Here's the new one. It defaults to list one, list two, that's what we used. So I just hit enter, and there it is. And our estimate was actually an underestimate. It was even stronger than we thought, but at least we knew it was decently strong and it was positive. We could tell that just by looking at the data points. Can you do that again? Sure. Um, stat. Go to calc, and number four, that's the linear regression. That's the one that's got AX plus B. And then enter. And you should get this bad boy here, right? Now, how's everybody doing with it? Anybody that wasn't here last time, of course, this was very quick, and you have no idea what the hell's going on, but um, is your R showing up when you do this? I'm not you only have to do once ever, so I'm not too worried about showing you what it's going to be. So now I'm going to do this. It'll show up. Cool. Okay. So what's my line of best fit? Oh, my God. What's my line of best fit? What's the equation for my line of best fit? Yeah, my slope is 0.0523, sure. Plus 628, sure. I like it. You can be more precise if you want to be. Now, on this, hopefully you guys understand, if I just go to 0.05, that could actually throw me off by quite a bit. <coughs> right, because if I change my slope, by an amount that I'm going to slowly kind of go way off track from where I should be. So you do want to take this one out at least a decent amount. You might as well take them both out to at least three non-zero places, right? Where do I go to get my line to show up? Y, y equals. equals. So you go to Y equals. Clear that old guy out of the way. Put the new dude in there. 0 0.0523. Here's your X button. Don't forget that. If you forget your x variable, then it's just going to be a flat line, of course. y equals 7 is a horizontal line. Remember that from algebra? x equals 2 is a vertical line. y equals a number is a horizontal line. So 0.0523x plus 27628. Graph. 
and it's going right where we thought it would. Sweet. Thank God. Now, here's the last little piece I'll tell you. Um, I think in section 10.3. So this should be the same problem. It should be 26. It asks you to predict something. Now, they actually ask you a stupid thing there. but um, Just to remind you guys real quick, how do you tell this is strong enough what am I going to give you on the test? I'm going to give you the critical value. So it's a lot like a hypothesis test. Thankfully, it isn't. So don't freak out. I'm just going to give you the number that your R has to surpass to show that there's correlation, to be evidence of correlation. And in this case, oh, where is that? Silly there it is. N was 8. And for 0.05 level of significance, I need 0.707, and our R is above that. So it's evidence of correlation. So here's the thing. If I am sitting there and I am counting the chirps of this cricket in my room because I can't find it and I can't sleep with the damn thing going off anyway, so I might as well just count the freaking chirps it's making. Um, have you guys ever had that happen? Nah. There's a cricket in there. <laughs> You have no idea where this stupid thing is, but you sure as all hell can hear it. Um, let's say I, I, I count the number of chirps and I get, uh, what's wrong with you? I get, um, what's going to make some sense here? Yeah, I get 1,080 chirps. <coughs> and that's over the course of a minute. Right? I have no idea how I can count that fast, but I can. How do I predict the temperature then based on that? Do I Number one is, do I even trust my line of best fit to do that for me? Yes. Why? Because we just showed that the R value was strong enough for correlation, therefore I'm going to trust my line. If my R would have been 0 0.6 and it was supposed to be above 0.707, I'm not going to trust it. I can't use the line of best fit. But we know we can use this line of best fit. So if I see, if I hear 1,080 chirps in a minute, how do I see what temperature that correlates to? Times it per divided by. Can you just plug that in for yeah. x? Yeah, exactly. Cool. Right. What What were my x values? Chirps. What were my y values? Temperature. So now I have calculated. <laughs> this isn't perfect, is it? It's a, isn't like an average. It's an expected value. So it doesn't have to happen, but I trust it pretty well. It's going to be probably close to this temperature. So if I plug in 1,080, all right, you go away. If I plug in 1,080, oops, I need one more zero in there. Then I can get what the temperature should be, roughly. Okay. And here's a cool thing on your graph, by the way. If you hit second trace and see how that goes up into calc, this is just if you want to. You can just do that on your regular screen. But if you go to second trace, number one is value, and you tell it 1,080 for x. It'll actually find the place, and it'll tell you what y is. Right. Can you do that again? Sorry. Sure. Go to second mm -hmm. trace to get up into calc. All this stuff on the top is related to the graph. So I want to calculate something on my graph, I go to calc. And I want to calculate the value for a certain input. So I hit value number one. And then you could put in, if I see 1,080 chirps, it'll tell me what the y output is. It'll even show me on the graph where I am. Cool. Now notice one little thing. I mean, if you get further along in statistics, where does it seem the line actually works better, even though I have a very small sample? This actually happens. Sometimes you'll have it really spread out up down here, and then they'll actually be really tight in here, and then they'll be really spread out up there. So if I happen to be in here, I would actually trust it more. I could even cut my 
I can even cut some of my data points off and find the line of best fit for the part that looks to be really lined up nice. I mean, here's a really stupid example of this. If I'm talking about fish and how old they are, and I plot data points, I'm looking at this is how old and this is how long they are, length. What's happening up here at the top? What do you think that is up there at the top? No matter how old they are, they are What happens? Yeah, exactly. You reach a certain age and you stop growing, thankfully, right? Or else you got some fish that's eating every other fish in the distance that looks up. So would you want to do uh, an R for the, all the data? Or would you want to cut off your data and just focus on where it looks to be a straight line? So you're that's perfectly allowed. You're not cheating then. The problem is, if you look at section 10.3, here's how this ties in. Section 10.3 actually asks you, what if you recorded 3,000 chirps a minute? You could just plug that in here. Now here's the giveaway. If you try to do what I just did, can somebody tell me why this won't work? Try to put in 3,000. And it says, what? It's off the graph. The really cool thing about doing this on the graphing calculator is it actually shows you where this line is valid. It's only valid within the data you have. So 3,000, isn't that way above any of the data that I have? Yes. Yeah, the highest data point I have is 1,200. So this line does not work past that. Because I don't know what could happen past that. At some point, the crickets might just go, oh, screw it. <laughs> it's too hot now. <laughs> I'm going to chirp it all. Right? So, I mean, I, I can't predict that. I don't know what's going to happen after that point. You guys kind of with me? Yeah. All right. I mean, that's the stuff that you don't learn at this level is how much flexibility you have with this. You still have to make it um, uh, in have integrity. So if you chop the, if you chop your data points off like here and here, then you're saying it can only work for data in here. I can't put something out there. I can't put something out there, right? Okay, okay. So that's more than I wanted to say. Um, so is that cool for an example of that? That's basically exactly what I'm going to give you. What do we do with this chart? Uh, what will you do is nothing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look up the number and just put that on the test and say your R value must be above this to show correlation. So on the test, I'd say something like your R value has to be above 0.48. So then if you get a 0.51, you're like, oh, cool, that shows correlation. Okay. Yeah. OK. So what do you guys want to do now? Obviously, I would think uh, a couple of hypothesis test examples, maybe. Is this cool for chapter 10, though? Is you're just going to give us one like this? That's just one. Okay. Yeah, they're long enough. I'm going to give you one, and I'll tell you right now, it's going to be probably around as long as the one that was on the practice test. And it's going to be real data. So what I like to do very often is I like to give data, even if you're not interested in sports, I love to give data like uh, teams, how well their offense is versus how many games they've won. And you can see how strong the correlation is between offense and winning games. right? I can do something else. I like doing the census stuff because that's true data. And you never know if somebody's actually done the study. We might be doing a study that nobody's done, which is kind of cool, right? Like on the practice test. Yeah. So t for 26 in section 10.3, um, yeah, each of these just wants you to find the line of SFIT. And then they want you to try to plug that data value they give in. Like for this one was plug in 3,000. <laughs> Plug 3,000 into the equation, <coughs> and of course it's bad because it's way beyond our data. Yeah? What does R mean? <coughs> R, this R was good because it was above the 0 0.707 it had to be to show evidence. But the closer R gets to 1, no matter what's going on otherwise, the more I'm going to trust that line. To me, it's not exactly like standard deviation, because if I don't deviate at all in a data set, my standard deviation would be zero, right? This is sort of backwards from that. Zero means I'm like crazy deviation, but it's still the same idea. The closer I am to one or negative one, 
the tighter my points are to the line, the less they go away from a line, right? So our picture shows you why it's not one, but at the same time, why it's not that far away from one, because they are, I mean, these are like almost right on top of it. That's a little far away, these get a little further away. That's why it's not perfectly one. If I can somehow drag these in, then my R would get closer to one. Is that cool? Yeah. yeah. So R has to be between negative one and one? Exactly. Good question. Yeah. I like it. So a lot like probability, it's got, it's got boundaries. Negative one is perfect negative correlation. What would negative two mean? Like impossibly perfect. Uh, what would that mean? I don't know. The R squared, the thing we don't have enough time for, which is unfortunate, but it, it's understandable. R squared actually does tell you something. That's why the calculator gives it to you. It tells you that the amount of variation that's explained by the variables you're looking at, right? So what else could affect the chirping of a cricket? Besides temperatures. All right, somebody stepped on the poor dude, right? <laughs> Could be chirping, not at all. What's the temperature? It's zero. Shit, there's no chirp. He's dead. Okay. Um, but also maybe the age of the cricket. If he's been injured, I agree with that, right? There's other factors. So how many factors are we looking at here with this study? Two, really. The effect of uh, we're looking at chirping, and we're looking at temperature, right? So we're really, in a way, we're just looking at one factor. It has to affect another variable, right? So this tells you. 76% of the variation in the chirps, or the variation in the temperature, you can actually look at it either way, 76% of that variation is explained by the other thing, right? So the temperature changes, so there's the chirping, but there's still like 24% unexplained. It could be the age. If I did a, uh, the same analysis, but age of a cricket and how much it chirps at a certain temperature, then I can see how much that affects the chirping, right? And it might be a good or a bad uh, correlation. You guys kind of with me there? How much do you have to know anything what I just said? Not really, <laughs> but at least for the test. But for me, it's very interesting to know that R squared does mean something. It's kind of cool. It's the percentage of the variation that's explained by what I looked at. Because there's always other factors I can look at. Cool. Um, For there to be evidence of <laughs> linear correlation, R has to pass that benchmark, that critical value, just like in a hypothesis test. Evidence on one side, we failed to find evidence on the other side, right? Now, what could be going on in reality? We could find evidence for correlation, but we could have made an error. We could have found evidence when there really isn't any correlation, but there's always that chance, right? And you saw like in the R table, you have an alpha 0.05 or an alpha 0.01. You have control over how much chance do you want to be wrong? 5% chance or 1% chance? Right? Okay. All right, so now do you guys want to do any specific suggestions on hypothesis tests to look at or somewhere else to go? Yeah, um, section 8.5, page 429, number 27. <laughs> Okay. It's page 429, and it's number 24. Um, heights of supermodels. Blah, blah, blah. So they're trying to show you that, they're trying to see the claim that the heights for supermodels are greater than the heights of general population of women, which you would expect to probably be true, which is true also for male models, right? Height is a valued attractiveness factor, right? So, um, so which part of this, let's see if we can, let's, let's just go ahead and go through this whole thing. What's the very first step on this kind of problem? The claim, I like it. So find the claim. 
And what's the claim that's being made here? I like it. So we have this population of supermodels they're trying to compare to the population of all women. And the claim that's being made is the mean of supermodels is greater than 63.6 for all women. I'm assuming this is probably in the U.S. I don't know. So what's my H show? What's my H1? So this one, the claim is definitely going to be H1. Which happens a lot, and people start to think that the claim is always H1, but you should know. We actually have done a couple. The claim could be either one. It just all depends on does it have an equal sign or not. Right, so don't think the claim is always H1. That's not true. So in this case, it is H1. And what's the H show? You could say equal to, or you could do like me. I say less than equal to, just the pure opposite. Can't you do equal to? You could. You could. So how many tail tests is this? One, one, tail. one tail. Right. I like it. So up here. Um, second step. What am I allowed to use or what do I have to use? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Just the fact that uh, it's greater than. I only care about showing my sample shows up up here. Okay, so if it was two tailed, what would it say? It would say, it could say one of two things in general. It could say, test the claim that it they are this tall. <laughs> That's kind of hiding it, isn't it? They are this tall, which means the opposite is they aren't. And aren't is up or down. How can you not be equal to something? You'd be bigger or smaller. So that'd be either way. Or they could say, test the claim that it isn't this, which is a little more direct. Like I just said, to not be that, you have to be bigger or smaller. This has a directional word in it, greater. So I know it's going to be a one-tail test. And in fact, I know which side it's going to be on. Mm -hmm. Cool. I just thought, I mean, what I remember is if it's equal to, it means two-tail, right? And then... Like well, if it, if it that's gets, the problem, though. If your though. claim is equal to... No? Yeah, no, no, no. That's true. Yeah. If if your claim is that it is something, mm -hmm. then the opposite must be it's not <laughs> that, and that would be a two-tail test. Mm -hmm. But it's usually when it gives away when you know your claim, that's when I. Know. Yeah, exactly. The minute you know your claim, the minute you know your H1, really, that's when you know if it's one or two-tail. Right. If this is not equal to, it's two-tail. This is one direction on the other, it's one tail, in that direction. So what's my next step? Here's what I'm talking about. The next step is finding the c squared t squared. Well, which one I can use, right? Mm -hmm. And in this case, can I use z or t? Z. Blah 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, well, this is interesting. The heights are measured. The simple random sample of supermodels. Oh, I see. Got it. What? The mean? What? All right. So where did this standard deviation come from, the 1.5 inches? Sample, sample. From the sample, right? And in fact, how big is our sample? Nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine people, right? Okay. Cool. So I think, if I remember correctly, this is where they cover their ass here. Assume that a random sample has been selected from a normally distributed population. So does n have to be 30 or greater? No. no it could be anything it wants to be, right? So you know it's normal from that little blurb at the beginning of this section, right? So it's normal. You've got to check that out first. So on the quiz, a lot of you guys are just saying, we don't know the standard deviation, so use t-scores. That's not enough. It has to be normal also, so you have to actually tell me why it's normal, right? On the quiz, the sample size was big enough. And the sample size was not 182 on the quiz. You did not pick 182 points. You picked 32. That's your sample size. Um, so in this case, it is normal because they told me, not because the sample is big enough. And secondly, we don't know what? Standard deviation of the population. 
because the one they gave me came from the sample. So therefore, we have to use T scores. The same thing you should have used on the quiz. Because it's unknown. The deviation's unknown. We don't know. Now be careful. I, I really want to make a big deal out of this. We do know a standard deviation. Yeah. It's not unknown. We just don't know the population standard deviation. So never forget this. T scores were invented to cover our ass for when we don't know the population standard deviation. Therefore, that's what you look at. Do I use a T-score? Well, do you know the population standard deviation? No? Okay, T-score. Yes? Okay, Z-score. Right? As long as it's normal, that's how you figure out which one to use. In this case, we don't know sigma. They only gave me S. So I have to use T-scores. So third step is... <coughs> I don't want to get too far away from this side of the room here. Third step is actually find that T score that's going to tell us something. And what do you have to know to figure out the rejection region? What's alpha? 0.01. And I have a one tail test. Mm -hmm. And what's my degrees of freedom? Eight. Eight. You have nine minus one, eight. Eight. So what's that T score going to be? That's where I get scared here. And yeah, just to show everybody where this is coming from, here's my degrees of freedom. Eight. Yeah. Now I've forgotten. Well, what was 0.01? And one tail, 0.01, eight. 2.896, beautiful. I like it. So that's how you find that. That's why the T chart is so awesome because it's set up for one or two tail tests. Um, 2.896? And it is positive because it's up on the side. So how do you say that in words? Z star is larger. Yeah. If, if you want to put a T star there, cool. If you want to put a Z star, I don't care. If the score you find is bigger than 2.896, what can you do? Reject the hoe. Reject the hoe. Support the high. <coughs> cool. Because the formula for your score for the next step is the same. You put an S in there or a sigma in there, it's the same stupid formula. It's just a standard deviation there. On the test, I'll probably try to say, calculate your Z or T star, just to cover my S, or whatever you have to do. Um, so now, what's the stuff I know from my sample? N was 9. X bar is 70. 70. S is 1.5. And then, I see a few of you guys like doing it all into a formula together, like it has in the book. So the book has the formula. Uh, X bar minus mu over S over square root of N or sigma over square root of N. You just got to be careful like that. Right? The, the, the calculator can't see this, so you got to tell it what the hell's going on. I just always like to do this on the side here. Take the old standard deviation divided by the square root of 9. How are we doing? So in one way or another, you just don't do it twice. Don't divide by the square root of 9 twice. Either do it here and then use that standard deviation or put it all in here together. Right? Whichever way you want to do it. So now how do I set up my score? What minus what on the top? 70. Yeah, 70. My data point, 70 minus 63.6. Cool. That came from the claim over there, right? Divided by this new standard deviation. Come out to something somewhere like 13. 12.8? 12.8? So where did I end up? I actually ended up like here. <laughs> All right, that's 12. It was way the hell out there, right? So did I make it far enough away? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. All right, 
this is one that they could have even just not even given me alpha because it's just so stupid far away. I don't care what alpha is. <laughs> so do we reject or fail to reject? Fail to reject. No reject. 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 <laughs> we made it in there, right? Yeah. So if we yeah. make it into the rejection region, we have succeeded. We've gotten far enough away. If we don't make it in there, this would be where I would fail. But we didn't make it out there. We made it in here. We completely re we rejected the hell out of that thing. Right? We got so far away from this, the middle, that that can't be true. It must be higher for for models. Is that okay? Semi decent. I mean, that's how you tell. Why did they call this the rejection region? Because if you make it in there, you reject the null. <coughs> if you don't, you fail to reject the null. You didn't make it in there. Right. So right here, I can write reject ho oh, support high. Which one of those is my claim? The high is my claim, right? That's how I write my conclusion. I write my conclusion using this terminology. Support the claim that blah, blah, blah. That's the wording I want to use. Do you guys see how that works? At the very end, I can write this just by looking at this number and comparing it. Right? I can write these two things just by looking at this number and comparing it. The next step is the hard step. <coughs> Which one's the claim? This one. Okay, so I use that wording. That's the wording I use. It's nothing more than that. If that would have been the claim, I would have said reject. But that's the claim. I need to support the claim that blah, blah, blah. So how is that going to be written? Do you want it specifically like what you <coughs> write? Or do, can I like write like the sample data supported the claim that more than blah, blah, blah? Can you write that way? Yeah, as long as you capture the same idea. Okay, because you have to put like sufficient... Yeah, and, and, and some teachers use different phrasing, and they're very adamant about you must use this phrasing, which is funny since the other teacher in the next room is using different phrasing. Yeah, so it must not be that important. But as long as you capture, yeah, I think the book even uses slightly different. That's fine. So as long as you capture the idea, that's awesome. What I was taught, what I always just say, no matter what the book says, is this. <coughs> um, in this case, we have found sufficient evidence to support the claim that the average height of models is greater than general population. Or you could say the average height of models is, is, is uh, more than 63.6 inches. As long as you come back to the idea, physically what's going on with this, I like it. Don't just say, we found sufficient evidence to support the claim, period. No. What's the claim? Tell me. All right. Um, so we're always rejecting the whole and supporting the height. Yeah, you either reject the hoe, support the high. Because right? if you can say the first guy is wrong, you can say it looks like the second guy is right. Or you fail to reject this guy, which means you fail to support the other guy. If I can't say this first guy is wrong, I can't say the other guy is right. So we, we don't never like, reject high and support um, No. And the reason that is, and here's the funny thing about that quiz. You remember I asked you to do a hypothesis test to see if it's equal to 82, yeah. the average? And a lot of you guys failed to reject it, or some of you guys rejected it. The average was actually an 80 point something. <coughs> so if you failed to reject it being 82, you didn't like make a mistake. It's just that's what happens, right? But I can't say I, I uh, if I reject something, I say, well, it seems then that I accept this other guy. It seems you, because there's always a chance you're wrong. You want to word it so that you're always saying, I reject that, I support this, there's evidence for this. I can never accept or support a null. I'm always trying to uh, support the high because that's what sets up the rejection region. Right? Get in here, I show evidence for the high. Get out of here, I don't show evidence for the high. Okay. Yeah. Um, why do we use the mu? Why do we use the mu? <coughs> Instead of 
Oh, why do we use that where? Like, to set up the queen. Mm. Unfortunately for us, they have to give me the whole situation at once, right? Because it, it can't happen in real time. What happens in real time is I have a feeling about something, or I have a claim, or I think something's going on, or whatever. Like, I feel <coughs> this lake. I see a lot of dead fish, so I think that the chemicals are probably out of whack. The factory down the way is probably dumping some chemicals. So I have a, I have a claim. I think that the uh, chemical content in this lake is greater than what it normally should be, right? Have I taken any sample yet? So my claim has to be existing by itself. It's greater than 30 or whatever the level is supposed to be. You with me? Then I find a claim. The first time the claim, uh, I mean not the claim, but the first time that the sample data comes into play is step four. Everything else can be set up before I really know anything about the sample at all. Okay. Yeah. Can you please go over section 8.2, number two? Okay, real quick. Yeah, can we find a, a p value from here? Yeah, here were z scores, right? Mm -hmm. So I could find a p-value. The funny thing about 12.8, what do you think the p the p-value would be there? How much is in the tail here? Extremely small. I would say the p-value would be about zero, or you can say zero plus, right? You guys see that? Because can you look 12.8 up on the chart? No. And please, dear God, tell me you understand that if you say 0. .0001, I will accept it because the book says that. But you see how it's very wrong. I mean, once I get past 3.5, then the area is shrinking and shrinking, and I'm out at freaking 12.8. It ain't no 0. .0001 anymore like it was here, right? It's 0. .0001, whatever. You guys kind of with me? This was an estimate. Sort of, yeah. So I'd say about zero for a p-value. If my z-score is crazy, it's going to be like about zero for the p-value. What if you say that the p-value is is less than 0.05. I like it. Or even here, you just have to say the p value would be less than, um, what was the alpha? 0.01. It's definitely less than 0.01. So that would show evidence for rejecting, right? What about the quiz? What was p value? On the quiz, like I said um, last time, it would be of range. And what I'm doing really is I'm not really even counting that part of it. I just want to see if you guys could, could do it. Uh, it's a range of values for T-score. Some of you guys got p-values just because you thought you could use z-scores, but you really couldn't because you only had a sample of information, right? So with t-scores, the best you can do is to get a range of values. Because on this chart, and, and this is, I understand, this is a little weird. Tell me, on this chart, where are the areas? Where's the chart? There it is. On this chart, where are the areas? And how many are there? Tons. So I can find a lot of detailed information. On this chart, where are the areas? <coughs> At the top. And how many are there? Not freaking many. So here, I can get a very specific <laughs> p-value, because I can look it up. Here, can I get a specific p-value? No, I can just get a range. So for a sample of size 8, if our z, if our t score would have been like uh, 2 point Nine. I would have the best I could say would be that the p value would be between 0 0.01 and 0 0.005. Right? Now for ours, we got 12.8, which is way past this. So then you could say the p value is less than 0 0.005 officially. But I know it's even, I mean, it's crazy less than that. This is so far below that. If you don't quite understand that, I understand that. Right. It's not the easiest thing to understand. So for p-values and t-scores, I'm not going to really put that on the test. But I want you to know there is a way to find a range at least. Can right. we use the calculator? Yeah, that's uh, yeah. I remember you used the calculator. Yeah, that's right. So there's a lot of these things you could do on the calculator that um, I haven't shown you, right? Um, so you can certainly use a calculator for the t but I'm not going to ask for p-value for that anyway. Yeah, maybe just as a bonus. Um, and now, I'm sorry, someone? Yeah, 8.2, number 2, please. 8.2, number, number which one? Number 2. 2. Saying about p-value. Oh, yeah. All right, 
So, oh yeah, good. When the clinical trial, blah, 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 which corresponds to the claim that the expert increases the likelihood of having a girl. If you're responsible for developing the expert method, you want to show it's effective. Which of the following p values would you would you prefer? So if if you're trying to show evidence that it increases the likelihood of having a girl, where would you want your sample to show up? What side would your tail be on? This side. And you want it to show up in here. And how do you show even just to show up in there is good, but what's even better to be in there, but to be even further away, right? So I'd want to be like in there, but kind of far away. Which means what would be true about the p-value then? Pretty damn small. So you remember when I said in journals, they're not going to talk about alpha. They're going to talk about p-value. So everybody can make up their own mind. So they'll say a p-value of 0.0002. And that's all, that's all I need. I'm like, that's strong evidence for the fact that there's some difference, right? To show a difference, I want my sample to be really far away, which means it's going to have a big or a small tail, a small freaking tail. So which one of these p-values would be the best evidence of a difference? Zero, zero. The smallest one I see. <clears throat> right? That would mean that it's so far away, it's got a very tiny tail. It must be way away. So here's the 50% um, for girls. I want my sample to be so far above that, that what's more likely? I just happen to get a bunch of people that have happened to have girls, or my drug actually induced them to have girls? That's, if that's the right word. English is, seems to be my third language. <laughs> I want that what's more likely is my drug has an effect. Because at that stage, it's a 0.1% chance that I just happen to pick a bunch of women that happen to have girls. So what's more likely? My drug caused them to have girls. Right? You guys with me on that? That's the key idea here. And that's why in journals you'll only see p-values referenced. Because you can make up your own mind then. If p-value is 0.07, for some people that's good, for some people that's not good. So they just put that in there and let you make up your own mind. Okay, yeah. Yeah, actually, I didn't get number four as well, if you don't mind. Same thing. I do, but I'll do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. 20 couples used that, which is the result that eight of them had baby girls and 12. Even though the sample proportion is 0.4, can the sample data support the claim that is great? Oh, this is kind of a silly question. So when you first look through it, it might be strange. But think about it. If I if I if my claim is it's bigger than 50%, and then I go look and I get a sample that says it's 40%, what do I, what do I immediately think about my claim? I yeah, it definitely does not support my claim. In fact, it's evidence completely against my claim, isn't it? You guys with me? Mm -hmm. So, not to confuse you guys, but I could take one sample and get like 40% when in reality my drug is effective. I just happen to pick a sample where the women didn't respond to my drug well. I could take the next day, take a sample and get 90%, right? That's why in science, larger samples and repeatability of results, right? You always hear about some study somewhere in in, uh, well, Helsinki's big for this. In Finland, they did a study about if you smear uh, cream cheese in your face, you'll live longer. And then you wait and see another study says, well, we did it again. And no, that's, that's not right. We couldn't repeat their results, right? So that's that's idea of repeatability. So you that's why you still wouldn't say, um, you still wouldn't say, I accept that it's 50%. You say, I failed to reject that today. I'm going to try tomorrow. That's why I don't ever use the words accept and null. I just haven't rejected it yet. Right? OK. So where are we going to go now? Yeah. Uh, oh, like a P hat test? OK. Uh, let's see. What's a good one? Oh, I like that one's kind of freaky. Look at number 25 on page 411. 
What's the key word to know you want to do p hat versus mu? Yeah, or proportion, right? So if you don't see those words, and in fact, if you see the word average, should you use p hat stuff? No, if I'm saying test the claim that the average. Uh, test the claim that the average. Create the confidence interval that the average. I should not use p hat stuff. So on the quiz, there was no p hat stuff. It was all average grades, right? Um, so here, though, this is definitely going to be p hat stuff. This one, I like this one because it's so short. It's like you didn't give me enough information, right? Um, so at first, you guys like it because it's so short, and then you read through it like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? Jeff, what page is this? Uh, four level. All right, cool. <coughs> so let's see. What's the claim that's being made? Three quarters of all. I like people. it. So somebody wrote in the newspaper, three fourths of all adults use the internet. So their claim is the percentage of adults who use the internet equals 0.75. Right. So that's the claim. Cool. That's why I like this problem. Is whenever a newspaper article writes something like that, that's a claim. That's a claim that you could test. And if they don't back up their claim with results from a test they did, I'm not going to trust what they say, right? Or they at least have to have a link to some other study so I can go look at it myself and see what I think about it. Um, so which one is that going to be? <coughs> yeah, it's going to be the hope. What's the high going to be? I like it. And that's going to be a two-tail. Two I like it. Not equal to could be greater or less. Uh, hopefully none of you stop and say, well, 73% is not 75%, so screw it. It's not good. I don't have to do the test. Why can you not stop and say, it? you're right, 73% is not equal to 75%. So why should I waste my time here? Because you want to know how far away you get before it. you just can't accept it. More important than that. I mean, that's, that's the idea of the hypothesis test, but yep. why can't I not completely trust the 73%? It only came from 3,011 adults. So don't say, oh, 73% is not 75%. Screw it. What we're actually trying to do is, is the fact that that's not equal to 75% explained by just randomly picking fewer people that use the internet? You with me? Or is it actually that it isn't 75%? That that actually shows you what the real percentage is of the population, or at least that it's lower. So that number by itself doesn't tell me anything about reality because it comes from a sample. Um, <coughs> so there's my claims. There's my hypotheses. Do I use a Z or a T? It's definitely always Z or nothing for an NPQ problem, right? And I saw in the quiz a lot of you guys got that information, but it wasn't an NPQ problem, so you had to be careful. Um, so definitely Z as long as what's true? Normal. So NP and NQ have to be bigger than 5. So what's 3,011 times 0.75 and 3,011 times 0.25? I don't know. Help me out. Ah, cool. Blah, blah, blah. It's definitely bigger than five. Right? So both of those have to be bigger than five. If either one or both are less than five, what can we do? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> don't say use T scores. Right? Because it's not normal if that's not true. And C scores require normality. Okay. Uh, so now I've got what the hell I'm talking about, what I'm allowed to use to talk about it. I can definitely use Z scores. Um, what's my rejection region? What's my alpha? Did they give me an alpha? No, you can, you can pick Beautiful. That's another reason why I want to pick this. They didn't give me an alpha. Generally, you go Shit. 0.05. 0.05. 95%.